Okay, we're on lesson number four, Life of Jesus, Chronological Order. So far we have covered 22 of the approximately 187 events of Jesus' life in chronological order. It's not that there were only 187 events in His life, obviously, but certainly that which is recorded has been broken down into those, that group of numbers. Last week, um, the section uh, that we reviewed, remember the seven periods? We did this in the first, uh, our first lesson. So last week, uh, the section reviewed uh, had to do with the early ministry around the uh, northern area of, uh, of Galilee, where he was raised. Tonight, um, our study begins with Jesus' appearance in Jerusalem. And um, we watch as his ministry begins to build momentum. And the section we're looking at is section three, first Passover to second Passover. So we begin at number 23. Jesus cleanses the temple, John chapter two, verse 20, uh, 13 to 25. Now the first glimpse we have of Jesus as a young boy is when he's at the temple and he's, you know, he's discussing the law with the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, he was concerned at that time, he said what? I, didn't you know I would be where? Yeah, my father's business, my father's house at that time. But as a boy, he remained in subjection, not only to his parents, but to the elders and to the leaders of the nation, so on and so forth. As a man, however, he still has a zeal for the Father's house, but now expresses it in a much more dynamic way since he has begun his public, his public ministry. Now there's a debate whether or not there is one or two cleansing of the temple. Scholars go back and forth about that. In the book of John, John puts this incident at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and in Matthew, Mark and Luke, they put it at the point where Jesus enters Jerusalem triumphantly and you know, He goes into the temple to do this. So sometimes some say, well, there was only one, they just they put it at different times. Good arguments on both sides. My own view is that John put it at the beginning and Matthew, Mark and Luke put it at the end. So it seems to me there were two events, two similar events, just, you know, why not just go with what the Bible gives us? You know? why, why make up stuff? I mean, there are two multiplication of bread and fish. You know, he fed two crowds relatively in the same way. So why not two cleansings? There were more than one miracle, more than one sermon, could easily be more than one cleansing. Anyways, both times, however, the reasons were similar for Jesus' actions. And his actions were, of course, throwing out the money changers, the animals, and so on and so forth. So there are two reasons why he did it. Number one, there was a violation of the law going on here. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of small for you, but I just wanted to put up a little map there. What was going on in the temple is that they were selling animals and exchanging money in the court of the Gentiles. And in doing so, they were desecrating their worship. So the court of the Gentiles, the way that the, um, the, uh, the temple was set up, this is a simple drawing here, uh, it, it was separated into different sections, different sections for different peoples. And, and, and the idea was to show that God was in the center and you, know, you went further out as the courts dictated. So the, you know, the, 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 holy, the, the, um, the holy of holies was the most you know, inner part um, there was the curtain, the holy place, the burnt offering. This was the court of the priests. Only the priests could come in here. Only the high priest could come within the holy of holy. You know, only once a year the high priest. You know. the, out here you had the court of the men of Israel. So only males could go in this section here. And then the court of Israel, women could go here. Children, women could go here. And then the furthest court out was the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles was where um, uh, proselytes would be, people who were not Jewish, you know, culturally, but who had been converted to Judaism, or who were sympathetic to the, to the uh, Jewish uh, religion. 
So the most inner courtyards were reserved for the priests and then as they extended outward for the men, for the women, and then finally the furthest out were for the Gentiles. Now, the money changers and the herdsmen who were there to service the, winner, uh, the worshipers, because worshipers didn't bring their sheep. You know, if they came from 100 miles away, they didn't bring their sheep with them. Some of them came from other countries. So they had to change their money. The money changers, they had to change from the currency that they had in the other country into currency that was usable uh, at the temple. And so there were money changers who were exchanging money. There were uh, sellers of animals. You could go in and buy an animal and then offer it up or give it to the priest to offer up. So it was, it was a legitimate business. It's not that the business was not legitimate. It was a legitimate service that they were offering. And I'm going to move again. The problem was they should have been out here. They should have been out here. They should have been out here near the gates. But instead they had moved inside the temple area and had set up in the court of the Gentiles. And so the money changers who were there to service worshipers, bringing in animals and so on and so forth, they were ruining the worship and desecrating the worship place of the Gentiles. And this was basically blatant discrimination and disobedience. So Jesus makes quite a stir by making a, a whip out of cords and he drives out the money changers, the, herdser, the herders, the animals, so on and so forth. And this is done as a sign that the temple was meant to be pure and holy. And pure and holy in every section of it, even the court of the, yes, please remind me later. There we go. Uh, uh, even in the court of the Gentiles. There was another reason why uh, they, that he did that, they violated the law, so he was within the law of what he was doing. Secondly, it set up a prophecy of his death and resurrection. He did this to establish the idea that the temple, as magnificent as it was, would one day be destroyed and a new temple, his body, the church, would be established. So the Messiah comes to his house and finds it unprepared for his sudden arrival. So this is a type. You know, in the Old Testament, the prophets sometimes would act out their prophecies. They would tie themselves with a belt, or they would write something, or they would build something, and they would do you know, show and tell. The prophecy was show and tell. Some prophet you know, would lie on his side for you know, um, days and months at a time. Well, here Jesus is doing a, a show and tell, if you, if you wish. He comes to his house, finds it unprepared. This is a type for all of the parables and also what's called the living prophecy for the Jews. Their judgment was at hand. And it's also for Christians today. Jesus, you know, He can come at any time. There's two ways that Jesus comes for us, right? He comes for us in our own death, or He comes to us at the end of the world. Either way, He's coming for us. So during this explosive time, He also teaches and performs miracles and begins to draw His first disciples from the Jerusalem area. Next event, a visit from Nicodemus. Doesn't it follow? He comes in, he gains attention, people are talking about him. John 3. So it's natural that his tumultuous arrival at the temple, his signs, the teachings, would draw interest of not only the crowds, but also the religious leaders. So at the temple, some leaders were questioning his right to do what he did, and you know, wondered about what it meant his temple would be raised if it was destroyed. You know, they started thinking about this idea. So they saw him as a troublemaker and they wanted him silenced. Some, however, like Nicodemus, came to him secretly to learn more. So Nicodemus knew he was special, but he was very slow to come to faith. I just read in the Christian Chronicle uh, today that a woman who was 108 years old was baptized. And her daughter, who's like 90 or something, 80 or something like that, had been sharing her faith and had been kind of just you know, dropping hints and leaving the Bible. Well, we're going off to church now, mom. You know what I'm saying? And, and finally, she, she accepted to be baptized. I don't recommend that. You know what I'm saying? I don't recommend that. But she was slow to come to faith. 
Well, Nicodemus was one of those guys, you know, slow to come to faith. Jesus shows him that even he, a teacher, a scholar, required the new birth in order to enter the kingdom. John's baptism was for everybody, even Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't understand that night, but he stuck at it little by little, and we see him at the very end of Jesus' life when he tries to defend him, when they were accusing him unjustly, and then at his death he provides the costly spices to properly bury him. So Nicodemus was a slow and cautious disciple, but he did finally come around. You know, some people are like kindling. You know, they hear the gospel, boy, they're on fire right away, and they get others on fire. Others, boy, it just takes a long, slow time to get them excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 25, Jesus now returns to northern Judea. Chapter 3, of John. So after the dynamic appearance in Jerusalem, Jesus begins to travel back to the Samaritan territory in the northern part of Judea to work with John, who was there, preaching, baptizing. As a matter of fact, for a short time, Jesus is preaching and John's preaching, they overlap. They're actually preaching the very, the very same thing, right? I think I have a map here. Again, this, I'm going to move a little bit over here. Um, uh, <clears throat> so Jesus is down in Jerusalem, and of course, he's up Nazareth here and the Sea of Galilee. Cap Capernaum is on the other side of the sea. That's his house. That's where he lives. And so they move through the Samaritan, the Samaritan region. Okay? And, um, um, uh, John the Baptist was baptizing right here, Salim, or Anon, right here in this area here in the Jordan River. And so if you read that passage, you find that that's where Jesus, uh, Jesus also was. Jesus himself, the, the, the book says, the Bible says, he did not baptize, but his disciples did as he preached. Essentially, for a time, the message, John and Jesus, their message was the same. They were both preaching exactly the same thing. Repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's a, an overlap period. Next, John's second witness, next event that takes place. So at the beginning, John points to Christ as he is revealed by the Father and the Son. You know, basically, he's saying, the sign that I got from God that pointed, that, that told me that this would be the Messiah. Here are the signs. He's the one. He's the Messiah. So while near Jerusalem, he encourages his disciples to follow Jesus. But now that they're working in North Judea side by side, John's disciples notice that Jesus is starting to baptize more and more people than John. So they begin to question him. And so John answers them by acknowledging that the purpose of his ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. And that's okay. The fact that Jesus' ministry grows and his diminishes, he says that's exactly the way it's supposed to be. John knew and rejoiced to see Jesus arrive and do what he was supposed to do. As a matter of fact, John happily accepted the lesser role because he, he could see that, uh, that God's will was being actually fulfilled. So at this point, he knew that he had succeeded in his mission, but a little bit later on, he'll doubt. We'll get to that. 27, next thing that happens, John is imprisoned. Okay, now we had one guy preaching this, stirring up the crowds. Now we got two guys preaching this, stirring up the crowds. And this second guy is doing miracles. I mean, John didn't do miracles. He was a powerful preacher, but no miracles. But this guy, he's doing miracles too. Now we got two of these rabble rousers out there. Now John was a preacher of judgment to come. The theme of his preaching was repent, and so much of his sermons had to do with sin and the disobedience of the people. John the Baptist did not talk about the church or the love of the brethren or other issues. He was a one-topic preacher. His, preacher. his preaching, however, stepped on a lot of toes. The common man, he got his toes stepped on. The Roman soldiers, they got their toes stepped on. The prostitutes, the businessmen, even religious leaders, everybody, you know, everybody, it was like a scattergun approach. You know, everybody got some. Now he gets into trouble when he begins to meddle in the affairs of who? The king, right? He starts, you know, uh-oh. 
He, he messes with the king. Now Herod, who was the king at that time in that region, had stolen his brother's wife. And he divorced his own, in other words, stolen means he had seduced his brother's wife, divorced his own wife, and married this, his brother's wife, who was at the same time his niece. So this was wrong on a lot of levels here. Okay? And the thing about Herod is he was part Jewish. And so he knew better. He wasn't some Gentile Roman, he, he was part Jewish, so he knew better. So John publicly declares that this was against the law and Herod needed to repent. You couldn't seduce your brother's wife, divorce your own, marry this woman, and on top of that she's your niece. I mean, the, the, the law forbade that six different ways. So this caused embarrassment to Herod and his wife Herodias. So John's continued accusations would lessen their position with the people, which was not a good thing to happen. They wanted peace and quiet, let's just collect the taxes for Rome, everybody's happy. In order to silence him and stop him from stirring up bad publicity, Herod has him arrested, thrown into prison, whatever charge, insurrection. While he's in prison, John makes an inquiry about Jesus. Now you have to understand that John the Baptist believed that the Messiah that he was preparing the way for would come and usher in a great period of judgment, first and foremost. Everybody, you know, these Romans, these, these bad kings, these corrupt leaders, these hypocritical religious leaders, all of these people, you know, the ax is going to get to the root, their, their time is coming. That, that was his preaching and that was his belief. His view of the kingdom may have been similar to his fellow Jews at the time. As a prophet, and like most prophets, he knew the order of things, and he knew the general nature of the things that he prophesied about in the future, but he did not necessarily know about the time frame. He didn't know about the uh, the time frame, you see what I'm saying? Like he knew what was going to happen. You know, I'm, you know, I'm the precursor, that's me, and then the one that's coming after me, he's the Messiah, and then there's going to be a judgment, and then there's going to be a renewal. You know, he knew the things that were supposed to happen, you know, the sequence. What he didn't know was how far apart these events were going to be as far as time is concerned. In his mind, and I think we've talked about this in another class, when did he think all these things were going to take place? Anybody? In their lifetime. In their lifetime, absolutely. This is happening now. The Messiah has come, and He's come for one purpose. He's come to judge now. Man, we're going to take names. You know? we're going to, it's going to be bad. And is, is God going to judge? Absolutely. You know, but he had the time frame wrong. So then, imagine now, put yourself in his skin, okay? He's preaching away. Wow, Jesus is preaching away. Disciples are growing, the crowds are growing, everybody's excited. And then all of a sudden, he gets thrown into jail. Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to judge these guys. I thought the Messiah, when he came, there was going to be justice made. What am I doing in jail? And now they're going after the Messiah. And he's, instead of going to Jerusalem, he's heading north. <laughs> What's going on? As a matter of fact, nothing that he thought was going to happen was happening. So when neither judgment nor a great new order of things appears right away, he begins to doubt. And you know what? I don't blame him. I think that's a very human thing. He had the sequence right, he had the time frame wrong. Just like the Thessalonians, right? Paul had taught them and other apostles had taught them about the return of Jesus and so on and so forth. And so they thought, all right, well, it's going to happen in our lifetime. Might as well not get excited about you know, building a, an extra room for the baby or a, you know, saving any money. Shoot, why should we even work? You know? I mean, Jesus is returning, it's all going to end. You know? So they had the right thing that 
that are going to that are going to happen, but the time frame was wrong. So John sends his disciples to question Jesus. He thinks maybe that he's made a mistake, and Jesus isn't the one since his concept of what was supposed to happen didn't happen. And you know what? A lot of people are like that. A lot of people are like that. If their lives don't work out like they think it should, they begin to question and doubt God. Wait a minute, God, wasn't I baptized? Don't I go to church regularly? Don't I pray? Haven't I really you know, tried hard to avoid sin? Haven't I made sacrifices? You know, I've been a regular giver. I go to all the things. I, you know what I'm saying? The things that I'd love to do, but I know that may be sinful. You know, I, I really have worked hard to, to push those things out of my life and to live a righteous life. Well, how come my daughter has breast cancer? What happened? That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to work that we're happy and things go well. And you know, it's an old story. You know? Why does this crook over here, my neighbor, who ripped off the insurance company for a new roof and pocketed the 10,000 buck, why does this guy have six grandkids? And my, you know, my daughter, the only one that I have, you know, why does she have breast cancer? That's not supposed to happen. I mean, so, I mean, I, I've made up a scenario, but you, know, you can make up your own. So, you know, Jesus replies, and He says He was doing all the things that what said He was supposed to do. He said, everything that this said I was supposed to do, I am doing. I am teaching, I am healing, I am raising the dead. Never mind what your concept of how it's supposed to be. Never mind about that. You focus on the Word of God. If I'm doing what the Word of God says that I'm going to be doing, then I'm the one. You don't have to worry. You, you, just, you, know, you just continue living your life. So Jesus rebukes those Excuse me, these were the signs given to create faith in those seeking the Messiah. And John should trust in these things, not his idea on how things could and should be. That's like, you know, today I feel good, so I must really be safe. Tomorrow I feel kind of lousy and a little down. I guess God doesn't love me very much. You know, what is that all about? And then, for added measure, Jesus rebukes those who rejected John. Even, the, even his disciples were starting to wonder about John because, wait a minute, you know, this, he's not a very successful guy and he's in jail. And so Jesus even rebukes the ones who were doubting who John was. Who did you go out and find, he says. Who did you think you'd find? Some guy in nice clothing and super successful? And then, John's death, interesting that all four writers record John's death at the hands of Herod. Herod had a, an interesting relationship with John. He was part Jewish, so he was familiar with the Jewish religion, recognized John as a powerful preacher and righteous. I mean, he got it, Herod got it. He knew that John wasn't just some crackpot. He knew that John had some sort of power. And he was naturally drawn to him. He kept John in prison for a time and he'd bring him to hear him preach in private. <laughs> Let's have a Bible study. He was also a worldly man, shrewd as a politician and ruthless as a leader, so he was in great conflict about what he should do with John. His wife sensed this and ultimately tricked him into executing John in order to save face. So when Jesus hears about John's death, he leaves the area of Judea altogether that he's working in and he returns back to Galilee, a safer and a, fr a friendlier place for him to be for the time being. Next event follows right after that is the Samaritan woman. Where, where is he? Well, he's in Samaria. What's he doing? He's preaching, he's baptizing, he's, he's working, he's, I'm working here. So we know that he was in Samaritan territory, baptizing with John. John is taken away, John is killed, it's time to move along. And during this period on the way home, he meets a Samaritan woman at a well and speaks with her. You know the story. She's not only a Samaritan, she's not liked by the Jews, she's also a much divorced woman who is living with her boyfriend, which makes her not much liked by the Samaritans either. 
She's like, you know, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you've all been in Bible classes where it says, you know, she came out at, the, you know, at noon. That's not when you go out to get water. You know, it's hot. You go get water near the end of the day or very early in the morning. She went out at noon because nobody was there. She didn't want to see them. They didn't want to see her. And there's Jesus. So Jesus reveals His true person to her. I mean, that is so amazing when you think about it. Samar a totally rejected Samaritan woman, and He goes ahead and reveals to her who He is. That's just amazing. That He revealed who He is to a Samaritan woman, and the first person to know of His resurrection is a woman. So He reveals her past, but more than that, He shows her kindness. And His acceptance of her and His answers to her questions win her over and she, the outcast, gains the courage to go tell her neighbors and friends about Jesus. And we find out that because of this, He stays even a couple of days in the area, delaying His return in order to teach and preach to these people. 31, got to move. The public ministry in Galilee, we're moving up. He gets to the north. After he finishes in Samaria, the writers tell us he returns to his home region, officially begins his public ministry there, officially I say, because before, with the calling of the disciples and the miracle at Cana, he was still acting privately. He was still among his family. He was still among his people. It wasn't a public ministry yet. yet. But once John has died, he has to step it up. Jesus goes home, he begins there to preach and teach not only about the kingdom, but now he begins to preach about his role in ushering in that kingdom. Now the message of him and John that overlapped for a time, now he is superseding that message. Now, now he's adding more information to that message. At first they're happy to hear him because a lot of them had seen him cleanse the temple in Jerusalem and so they wanted to hear him preach in their own hometown. And he follows that up with a second miracle at Cana. I, I shouldn't say second because we don't know all the miracles he did, so another miracle at Cana. We know that miracle was the first, this is another one. So he returns probably to the friend or to a relative where the wedding had been held for a visit. And while there, a royal official, one of Herod's household, how ironic, they're trying to avoid Herod, but one of his household, comes to him to heal his son who's lying sick across the lake at his home in Capernaum. Where does Jesus live? Capernaum. You know how big Capernaum was? It's a little village, it's just a little fishing village. Even to this day, it's not a very big place. So it was a very small place there. There are good odds that Jesus even knew this person. So Jesus sends this man home, and um, Jesus sends this man home telling him his son is well, and while on his way the man learns that the child has been healed at the point where Jesus had told him to return. Now this is the only miracle recording during this period in his Galilean ministry. It's interesting that it is the first time that the writers associate faith in Jesus with miraculous healing. The first time that this is mentioned for this miracle. The man and his entire household become disciples after this incident. So this is the end of this section. After this miracle and after this teaching in the area, Jesus will then again return back to Jerusalem for the second Passover in His ministry. So the events covered today took place over a period of one, approximately one year. Not a lot of things. When you put it in chronological order, I mean, 365 days, we've covered how many events? Yeah, well, just in the Galilean ministry, you know, not a lot of things going on. 32, I mean, if you talked about things that happen in your week, you could list 32 things pretty quickly. Maybe not as dramatic as this, but certainly. So that's why when John at one point says, if everything that Jesus did you know, was written, uh, there are no books that could contain it. 
Because it's not like, I, I'm, I'm thinking, it's not like he did one thing and then he went home and you know, played video games and hung out and just took it easy and relaxed. No, he was busy. I'm, he was about the, 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 the father's business. So a couple of lessons here. Lesson number one, Jesus was not soft. As a Catholic boy uh, growing up, I remember uh, getting into trouble uh, in school. <clears throat> and those were in the old days, maybe some of you remember this, they believed in corporal punishment in Catholic schools where I went. And if you got into trouble, you went to see the principal. And I went to a Catholic and it was an all boys school. It was uh, the brothers, the Christian brothers. You know, they were like nuns, but they're the male version of, of nuns. And the principal there, uh, um, Brother Irenaeus, oh, that was my teacher, but anyway, that's not important. So I'd go to the principal, and in those days, they used the strap, which was a long piece of leather like this that had a, a piece of lead in the middle. And uh, uh, you would go in, and what, why are you there? Well, I was talking to Johnny, or I was goofing around as usual, you know, and uh, they said, all right, stick out your hand. And I stuck out my hand. Five swipes on this hand, five swipes on, this is with a leather strap. Five, and I mean your hands were, you could feel your heart beating in your hands. You know, boom, 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 boom. And then after he finished that, he would give me a picture of Jesus and say, go with God. It was a good way to build up my faith and my love of the Lord. <laughs> Now I say, I tell you this story because the picture of Jesus, the one I remember the most is of a young man, you know, a, young, a young sailor lad you know, with the, you know, at the wheel of a ship, you know what I mean? And Jesus is standing behind him you know, as his co-pilot. You know? And there's Jesus in all his blue-eyed, blonde, sandy, blonde-haired glory, you know, looking kind of soft. You know? He looked like an event planner or something. You know? <laughs> So there was this very, there was this very, no offense to any event planners out there, but there was this very, there was this very soft image of him. You know, he, he, he was not a manly man, you know what I'm saying? He was a very soft man. But when you read the stories in the New Testament, he was not a, a soft man. It wasn't all about love and tenderness and forgiveness. I mean, he's all of these things, but his appearance at the temple shows that he's also a zealous Lord who hates sin and who hates unholiness, who hates worldliness, who despises hypocrisy, and he gets physical. So we mustn't forget that when Jesus returns, he will not do so as the suffering Savior. When he returns this time, he comes back as the Lord of Lords, coming to judge and punish the unfaithful and the wicked and reward those who have been true to him. So it's not that soft, gentle Jesus that's coming back. You know, it's, it's that one that John is talking about, comes back to judge. And then maybe another lesson out of this is Christians need to be ready to pay the price. You know, John the Baptist lived like a hermit. Uh, out in the desert, no alcohol, no meat, no, you know, he lived like a hermit. He preached an unpopular message. His job was to prepare the way for the glory of another person, not himself, and then he died as a martyr for his trouble. Thank you very much, you've done your job, go directly to jail, lose your head. You know, I mean, pretty rough. I think the point we can see from John's life is that we all pay a certain price to follow Jesus and it's different for every person. However, when we go into the waters of baptism to bury our old man of sin, when it says we die with Christ, I want us to understand that that's not just a metaphor. I know the action is like, you know, burial is like, you know, the action is a metaphor, but what we're actually doing at that time is not a metaphor. What we must realize is that we give up the claim to own or control our own physical lives when we die with Christ in baptism. That's what the death is about. The, the old man just died. I don't control me anymore. That was my big issue about being baptized. It was the thought, I will not control me anymore. He will control me from now on, whether I like that or not. So God may permit us to have our life for a while 
or He may just require us to give it up for the Lord in a single day. Just like He required it of John and so many others. So when you become a Christian, you're either going to give your life to God one day at a time, or you're going to give it to Him all at once. Most of us give it to Him one day at a time. It's like spending money, you know what I mean? You've got so much money, you're giving it to Him a you know, dollar at a time. You know, you got a million dollars, you're giving it to Him a dollar at a time. But sometimes, and maybe even in this room, there may be a time or a moment in your life that comes when He'll ask for everything all at once. And I think that we, I don't think, I know, we have to be prepared for that eventuality as well as, as the other. I think that's the story of John the, John the Baptist. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention.